I feel kind of bad starting on a, on a sad note, but it, the truth is, death is a part of life, and, um, and we go through that. This week, we have been hit hard as a church. There was, um, there was a, a death on Monday where um, Terry Daniels went home to be with the Lord after a long fight with cancer, and her family's here today. And um, yesterday, Bill Harvey went home to be with the Lord, and his wife is here in service today. Tuesday, I fly back to Minnesota for the funeral for my nephew, who's 21 years old, and he was uh, injured in a car accident that killed my sister um, 19 years ago, and uh, fell on Easter this past Easter, re-injured his, um, his head, did not recover, and, and so we'll be going to say goodbye to Brett this week. And so many of you, um, I know this isn't the primary purpose, but Memorial Day often is a time where we go and visit cemeteries, and we go and we lay flowers and we give thanks to God for the memories of loved ones. So I want you to know that our hearts go with you, and uh, we will celebrate families. See, families help us get through these times. This is why every, every May we kind of come back to family, because I can't think of anything else that helps us, that makes the Lord's love more tangible than the love of family. And when I say family, that's a broad definition. There are all kinds of families. There's, there's, there's mom, dad, and two or three kids or more. Um, there's families that have step-parents. There's families that are blended. There's families where there are no children in the family or families where grandma and grandpa are actually raising the kids. There are families um, that, that I would call are formed by Velcro connections. It's, it's where you actually you've become so close to someone who's not biologically related, and yet you've stuck together and you can't let go. And so you love each other like family. All of those people, even the church family for many of us becomes our family, helps us get through difficult times in life. And that's why it's so critical that, that we strengthen the family. That's one of our core um, practices as a church, to connect seekers, to grow believers, to strengthen families and impact communities, because our culture seems to be pulling families apart, of driving wedges between um, husbands and wives and parents and kids, and our job is to bring it back together and, and remember that, that the Lord wants to be at the core of our marriages, at the core of family life. Someone gave me a study, it's an executive summary of a study that was done, to see whether Religion has a positive or negative effect on family life. And actually what they discovered, they, they surveyed 11 developing countries who progressed very well, can, countries like Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, United States, a, a lot of these countries, and said, what has been the effect of religion? Because their, their, their belief was, as we've progressed as a society, as we think differently, we've cast aside old traditional structures and we've adopted new ones that are, that are actually better for family. And they actually found the opposite. They found that actually families who have a strong religious of faith, one that is very strong, I'm not talking about casual, a strong religious faith are, are happier, healthier, and have more children in those families. And it makes sense because if a husband and a wife are committed to each other and believe that God is active in here, one of the fruits of their love is children. Now, last week I gave this message that um, on, on God making sex as something very good for marriage. It is something very powerful, something very good. And what came out of this study to confirm what I said last week is this. Um, those who have that higher religious commitment enjoy a higher quality relationship and more sexual satisfaction than those with little or no religious life. And, uh, and what came out very clear is that it was especially true of women. Women who have a strong religious faith actually have 50% more pleasure in their marriage and their intimate relationship with their spouse than women who have very little or no religious connection. Is that interesting? That the thought was religion stifles marriage, stifles people, boxes them in, and the secular feminist movement was to remove those restraints. But what's happened over the last 30, 40 years, as studies have shown, is the, the level of women's happiness in marriage has actually gone down. As we become more, more kind of liberated, the joy has gone down to where it's less than that of husbands and less than that of their mothers and grandmothers at the same stage of life. And what I'm saying is, God knows how to put families together. And God knows some things that will really bless our families and make them awesome, really awesome. And maybe you're not in that place yet, but we want to help you get there. And, and there's a lot of topics we could talk about, but we've had uh, four of them um, during this month. And today is that fourth one. It's on awesome faith, awesome faith. See, God, God wants us to be awesome in our relationship with him. Faith 
can be looked at as a religious connection, like, like I belong to the Muslim faith or I belong to the Buddhist faith. But what I'm saying is this, this faith being a relationship, a trusting, loving relationship with God. That's what I'm talking about, biblical faith, a faith that actually acts. In fact, the Bible says that, that the way faith demonstrates itself is through love. And one time a man came to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment in Scripture? And in Mark chapter 12, here's how Jesus answered. The most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. Let me ask you. If there's one thing you could teach your kids, wouldn't this be like the best thing? If we could help our kids love God and love other people, that, that they would be a success in life? I mean, is, is, God, is God as impressed with making the honor roll, making the team, getting the scholarship to the college at the expense of this? See, one of the things we fail to do oftentimes is really take seriously our responsibility as parents to teach our kids something very basic, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And by the way, those four words are, are, are kind of tough to nail down because they fluctuate in meaning in Scripture. And so I don't want us to get caught up in, in compartmentalizing each one of those as much as this. There is a word that precedes each one of those, and the word is all. We are to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. And what, what Jesus is saying is love God totally, love God completely, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor, love other people equally. Love them the way you love yourself. But love God with everything you have. See, God doesn't want to be a priority in our lives. He wants to be the priority of our lives. He doesn't want to be like a spoke in the wheel. He wants to be the hub of the wheel. See, when God is in the right place in our lives, everything else falls into line. But when he's taken out, everything else starts to collapse. And so we have to figure out, how do I teach my kids to love God in this way? And I want to give you some practical ways to do that today. Because while this verse could mean a lot of different things and we could find a lot of meaning in it, I, th I thought if we could just come away with one practical step to apply this to our kids' lives and to our family life, wow, how much further would that take us along this journey of developing our family faith? And so I want to do that today. And, uh, and the first is this that we are to learn to love the Lord with a heart that is tender toward him, a heart that is tender toward God. Uh, love the Lord with all your heart. Well, how do you do that? You, you soften your heart toward God. Jesus told a parable once of a man, a farmer, who went about sowing seeds on the, on the ground and landed on four different kinds of soil. There was hard soil. The soil was, was compacted. Seeds could not even penetrate that soil. And so the birds would come down and, and they would snatch that seed and eat it. And then there were some soils that were uh, rocky and, and very shallow, and the seeds would get in there, and they would sprout, and then they would get, get burnt by the sun. And then there were others that, that were taken into the ground, and they began to grow, but because of other things going on in that soil, uh, weeds were growing, and other plants were growing. It actually choked out the good things. But there was a good soil, Jesus said, and that soil is the one that hears the word of God and retains it, takes it to heart. And that word begins to penetrate uh, the soil, and that, that word produce, or that seed produces. And Jesus said, the seed is the word of God, and these different soils are the hearts of people. And you know that our heart can become hard toward God to where uh, what we hear in church makes no difference in our lives. See, I love taking uh, my family to church. I'm very a strong believer in that, that making that a habit for a family. I think it's a very great habit, but it has to go further than just getting your, your butt in a seat. That's not, that's not what it's about, just sitting in a chair, and I, I did it, I checked the box. It's about being in a place where you can hear God. And you will not hear God if your heart is not receptive, if you don't have that good soil. So you can come into church like this, and you're not going to get anything out of it. And it actually does worse for you because everything that you're hearing is getting snatched away by these birds. And Jesus said that's representative of, of Satan. He's taking away everything. It's not, going to, it's not going to impact your life at all because it's not penetrating anything. So, so rather than have a heart that's hard, we want a heart that's receptive, that's open. That really, that's what soil is. Soil that's open receives the seed. So a tender heart is a heart that's, that's open to God. We want, it, we want to have that tenderness toward him. In the Old Testament, 
When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they saw all these great miracles of God delivering them from the Egyptian powers. I mean, they saw the plagues, they saw the Red Sea part, and they went on this wilderness journey where they saw God bring water out of rock and, and, and quail came in like the wind. They saw manna every morning. They saw the presence of God like a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I mean, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle. If you think there's anybody who ought to trust God, it would have been those people, and yet they struggled. They struggled. In fact, many of them, it says, became hardened in their heart toward God. And it's actually referred to a few times in the New Testament. In fact, twice in the book of Hebrews. This is one of those. It's found in Hebrews 4, 7. It's referring to those people back there. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like they did. Because you can harden your hearts. And what this verse says is today, God is speaking. God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you hearing him? See, one of our uh, values as a church is that God, uh, God is speaking all the time to us. And when you come into a gathering like this, our prayer is that you would encounter God, that, and even during worship, begin to open your heart to him, hear from him, and say yes to him. Uh, you know, the, the, when we sing and we take communion, all that is to prepare the soil. It's preparing soil and seeds being planted all through that time. And you hear the sermon, more seeds are being planted. And when you leave, hopefully those seeds will sprout and produce something. You just didn't waste, a, waste a 90 minutes or 75 minutes here at church. You're actually getting something out of it. And so we have to have this heart that's tender. There's a story in the Old Testament of a little boy named Samuel who's living um, basically at the church with a priest named Eli. And this little boy hears a voice one night, and he, he thinks it's Eli. So he goes and wakes up. Eli, the priest, and says, are you calling me? He goes, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Goes back to bed. Hears the voice again. Gets up, goes to Eli, says, I, I, hear, I swear it was you talking to me. He goes, no, it wasn't me, but you know what? Maybe it's God talking to you. So next time you hear the voice, say, speak for your servant is listening. Heard the voice one more time. Samuel stayed in bed and said, speak for your servant is listening. And God began to pour out a whole, whole picture of what was to take place in Israel in the very near future. Does God speak to children today? Are you helping your kids to listen to God? See, one of the reasons why it's so hard to teach our kids to listen to God is because some of us don't do it. You can't really teach what you don't know, especially a skill like that. If I'm not listening to God, it's going to be really hard for me to tell my kids what it's, what it's like and how to help them um, hear from God. And we have to set the pace for them. We have to lead by example. And when was the last time you shared with your children what God has said to you? When was the last time? When was the last time you said, oh, I was in quiet time today and God showed me this? Or I was at church today and God showed me this? When was the last time you did that? If you're not sharing that, it's not surprising to me that your kids probably don't know how to listen to God. See, I actually think God is speaking to you much more than you realize. And really... If you would just go home after church on a Sunday like this, in fact, I would encourage you to make this a Sunday habit. Go home after church on Sunday, and your kids may be with you in church, or they may be over in the next-gen building. Sit around the dinner table and eat and say, okay, what would you hear from God today? And each of you share. Start with the parents. I'll start first. Here's, here's what I heard. You know, Pastor Darren said this, or Pastor Sam said this, or, or during communion the message was this, and it really struck me, and this is where God's, God spoke to me. That's awesome and go around the table. And, and your kids may be in Sunday school or a Bible classes. What did God say to you? Well, we studied this story, and here's, here's what I think God's saying to me. Now, if you would make a habit of doing that, I can promise you this. What will happen is you and your kids will begin to come to church with an expectancy of hearing from God. You will, when, you're, when your child goes to fuel on Sunday night or goes off to camp and they come back and say, okay, hey, what would you hear from God? They'll be ready because you've been preparing them. You've actually caused them to believe God really does still speak to us today. And so uh, we want to develop this heart within ourselves and within our kids that's very tender toward God that, that listens to him. This verse also talks about the soul. That we love God with all our heart. We love him with all our soul. And I believe that, that the way we love God with all our soul is to pour out our souls to the Lord. It's emptying the contents of the soul. See, the, the word soul is used in different ways in the Bible. It can refer to a whole life. Like Jesus said, what is a profit of man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Or on the day of Pentecost, this is 3,000 souls were added to the church. Well, that's 3,000 people. That's a whole person. So in some ways, you could say the soul is the whole person. But there are other times in the Bible where the soul actually seems to refer to a 
almost like a compartment within you where you store your deepest feelings. And so we read through the Psalms, and there are a lot of references to the word soul in Psalms, and you, uh, you hear David and other psalmists saying things like, my soul rejoices in the Lord. Uh, I lift up my soul to the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord. I rejo- or my soul rejoices. My soul thirsts. At times, he says, my soul is bereft or my soul is embittered. What it says is there's a lot of emotional stuff packed in this place called the soul. And many of us don't know what to do with that when it gets down there. It just starts to churn. A lot of negative, sometimes positive stuff, but they all churn within there and we don't know what to do with it. And so back to Samuel. He had a mom named Hannah. Hannah um, never had any children and she was praying to God, just, just God, give me one son. Give me one son, God. I just really would want one son. And if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. And so one day she's praying and the priest Eli sees her and she is praying so intensely that you just see her lips moving. You don't hear any words. And Eli says, oh, she's been drinking. He goes over and tells her that. And she says, oh, no, 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 no. I've not been drinking at all. But here's what she says to him. She says, I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. I'm pouring out my soul. What do you do when your soul is weighted down with all this emotional stuff? You pour it out to the Lord. I mean, you don't have to. You can carry it. It doesn't do you any good to carry it. You pour it out. That's what Hannah did. Did you know Jesus did that? It says when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, anticipating going to the cross and suffering for the sins, you know, he looked at that and says, "Ah, I'm going to suffer God's wrath on the cross. And it says, my soul is deeply troubled. So what did Jesus do? Prayed. Poured his heart out to his father. That's what you do with your soul. You learn to um, empty the contents to your heavenly father so he can deal with it. See, here's the problem. Many of us are masters of cover-up. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of the reason may be because you've been hurt before. You've shared stuff and it hurts you. Or you've shared stuff and it came back to bite you. And so... Um, we stuff it, or, or there's stuff we've done that make us feel, feel really ashamed. You know, last week I, I spoke about um, the beauty of sex, and yet our culture has twisted that, and, and pornography is huge. And I, I suppose that in our congregation, just an audience like this, that there's a lot of people who've dealt with pornography. And I hope you didn't leave this place feeling shame as much as hope that God could rescue you from that. Maybe you've had an affair And there's guilt over that. Maybe you've done something outside your marriage that that you're ashamed of, and you're not about to come forward at the end of a service to to expose that and and get prayer for you. I mean, the Bible says to um, confess our sins to each other so we may be healed, but, you know, there are just some things that are so deep and personal. I'm not telling anybody. And so you carry that. But here's what you have to learn. There is someone who knows everything about you already. There's no surprises to God. God says, I know that. I've known that ever since it happened. I, I, I've known what you've done behind closed doors. I know all that. You're not, you can't hide it from me. And, and understand this, that the one who knows you best is the same one who loves you most. So the fact that you have all this junk going on inside of you and think, oh, I'm just so ashamed, I'm embarrassed, I, I don't want anybody to know, God says, I already know it. I just need you to acknowledge it. I need you to confess it. I need, I need you to kind of pour it out there to me so I can help clean it up. And, you know, as we raise kids, we want our kids to feel safe with us in our homes. So moms are often better than dads. Sometimes dad's better than mom. But we, we want to be that safe place for our kids to come and sit on the bed and just pour out their hearts to us. But, you know, as the kids get older, that, that can get a little harder. And when kids go off to college and do things that are, are contrary to what you taught them, then it's really hard. How do I tell my parents I've been doing something they told me never to do? And so wouldn't it be great if we could teach our kids that wherever you go, if you don't feel like you can come and talk to me, you can talk to God. And he will listen. And he'll help bring healing to that dark, wounded place within you. My, um, my brother-in-law, Todd, is, uh, he, was, he was married to my sister who was killed in that car accident when she was hit by a drunk driver. And uh, he lost his wife, and two of his sons became handicapped, one mentally, one physically, um, as a result of that. And um, my understanding is he wasn't at the hospital when when Brett, my nephew, died. And I think it was just too hard, too hard for him. He's, He's one of those guys that stuffs it. And I'm so glad he married a woman who doesn't stuff it. (laughs) She's very open. And she's very expressive, and I think there's a healing in that openness. In fact, she's been writing on caring bridges. She wrote this week. I'll just read you a little one paragraph she wrote, because I think it's very picturesque of her. 
She says, this week has had so many emotions attached to every day, relatives coming, a visitation, choosing what special things to display that remind us of Brett. We can't display a giggle, a peekaboo, or 10 little monkeys. Stuffed animals and toys will have to do. They're still Brett. A funeral? How do we get through the final goodbye? How do you bury your child? You know, when you read the Psalms, you read that kind of speech. You read, you read people like David saying, God, how do I do this? How do I face this? Where do I turn with this? I'm perplexed, God. I don't have answers, and I don't even know where to turn with this. But I will pour out my soul to you. I mean, do your kids ever see you do that? Do they ever see you come up for prayer, maybe in tears, saying, I need prayer? You don't have to be Superman, Superwoman. I can handle it. There's, there's a health because we're depriving our children of knowing that God is accessible. You know, prayer is one of those ways, but there's also another way that we open up our soul to God, and that is through praise. Remember when Mary, when she was pregnant with baby Jesus, she went to see her relative Elizabeth who um, just gave birth to John. Uh, John, middle name Baptist, whatever his last name is, John the Baptist, so forth, you know. He wasn't yet the Baptist, but John the Baptist was his little boy, little John. And so she walks away from that, and, and the next part of Luke, chapter 1, is, is Mary's song of praise, and it's called her Magnificat, or her Canticle. And the very first line of this says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Mary walks out of there going, oh, my soul just explodes with praise to God, to make God greater and greater, because uh, what he's doing is so incredible. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel that way? Do you know, when I first heard the song that we sang today, it's, that, that, uh, it's kind of a country western flair to it. You know that song, um, The Goodness of God? When we get to that chorus, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. You know, there, are, there are some songs that when we hit a chorus like that, or at early service today, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. You know what, as I'm getting older, I'm singing those louder. Yeah. It's like, I want the whole world to know. Yeah. God, you've been so good. God, you've been so great. I don't want there to be any doubt in my life. And I don't care who's watching. But one of the reasons we, we encourage you sometimes to bring your kids into service, we love what Next Gen Ministry does for kids, but sometimes we say, bring them over here. And what we used to do is have a special day where we would actually cater the service to the kids. And, and so parents would kind of like tolerate the service because we'd sing, you know, motion songs for the kids and we'd, we'd, we'd kind of tone the message down. But we've actually come to the conclusion that let's just do what we do. But we want kids to see how mom and dad worship. We think one of the best things kids can do is see how you do it. And if you're standing there like a bump on the log... And you're just kind of mouthing words, and they're going to think, that's how you do it, mom or dad? That's how you pour out your heart? That's how you pour out praise? That's how you magnify the Lord? What if they saw you caught up? What if they saw a tear run down your cheek in the midst of, of your worship? But we need to let kids see uh, our souls opening up. They need to see us come forward and kneel or come forward for prayer. They need to see that within us. See, we, again, we have to lead by example. And, and help our kids to open up their souls to him. We also need to help our, our families have a mind that's shaped by him. And what does that mean? It means that, I think it means that God is foremost in our thoughts. It means our thinking is guided by him. That we want to align ourselves with the truths of scripture. See, the, the Bible says that there are a lot of voices that influence us. A lot of voices that we hear through our lives. There's the voice of our friends. There's the voice of family. There's a the voice of the media and culture. And they're not always bad. Sometimes there's some very good voices. But sometimes there are negative things that come through those voices. And how do you filter what's good and bad? There used to be a time where we as parents would say, you know what, I can just trust that what they're going to see on TV, what they're going to see at the friend's house, what they're, um, what they're getting at school, all is going to kind of confirm what I've been teaching them. But it's not true anymore. Especially when you send your kids off to college. And that's why it's so critical what we do over in the next-gen ministry is to help kids learn to, to hear God's word and apply it to their own lives. 
And they're in the midst of other kids. They're, they've got a leader there, small group leader, and they've got peers, and they're all kind of wrestling with this scripture of what does it mean? What is God saying to us? And kind of this positive peer pressure, because one day they're going to go off to school, and they're going to get challenged by their friends or by a professor. And if they don't have a strong mind that thinks kind of deeply about God, they're going to crumble. They're going to crumble. And we want, to, we want our kids to think. We want them to think and think deeply. See, this is, a, this, is, this is a false belief that you have to kind of put your brain in neutral to really believe the things in the Bible. I would challenge you to look at some of the greatest thinkers our world has ever produced. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them were very godly men and women who saw no conflict with what they saw in Scripture and what they experienced in science and life and philosophy, all that it all fit together. And we need to think. In the book of Romans Chapter 12, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so when you give your life to Christ, what happens is God has to replace the old scripts, the old tracks that would play in your head about who you are and, and, and who God is and what's important about life. A lot of those we're having to replace. And so we, we look at scripture. And let me share with you one of the ways uh, I, I think we harm our kids. There was a study done years ago. It's, called, it's in a book, book called Exit Interviews, and people were interviewed on why they left church, and they gave all kinds of reasons why they were disheartened and, and left churches. Well, another book was written by, by a man who says, I wanted to go on the other side and find out why did people stay in church? Because if we find out why people stayed in church, maybe we can focus on that and increase the number of people staying in church. So here's, here's what they discovered. It was very clear that the one thing that stood out more than anything else was, was people said, my church helped me to, to understand what the Bible had to say about life. That's, that's what I got out of it. That's what I got out of a youth group in Sunday school. That's what my pastor taught me, that this book speaks truth into my life. And no matter where I go, whether, it doesn't matter if it's contemporary music, it's old style music, doesn't matter if it's a big church, little church, if, if, this, if this is still true, I can, take, I can transport that anywhere I go. So one of my fears is that um, even we as parents have taught our kids kind of like the, the polished stories of Scripture. Um, for example, here, here, here's a story, Noah and the ark. So if you go into a lot of nurseries, you'll see a picture of an ark, and you'll find animals smiling. You'll see a giraffe's head sticking out of the window, and, you know, all these elephants, birds flying around. It looks really cute, and you can even uh, buy um, toys that represent that, and kids put it in their, their bedrooms. It's really cute, but... If you really look at the story of Noah, it's a story of judgment. It's a dark story. There are thousands of dead bodies floating under that raging torrent of water. But we don't want our kids to know that part. We want them to know the draft was okay and the birds were okay and the elephants made it. (laughs) Noah's a family made it. But the truth is, God was judging sin. That's what that story is about. And yet in the midst of God's judgment, there is grace. God despises sin but he gives grace in the midst of it. And see, one, thing, one of the things we, we fail to teach our kids, sometimes we look at stories, we tell them what we think is the main point when the real point of pretty much everything in, in the Bible is, here's who God is, here's, here's what God thinks, and here's how we relate to him. It's really a story about God. That's why it's called Revelation. It's God revealing himself to us. And so we want our kids to realize you can get to know God through this book. It's far more than little cute verses we put on greeting cards or posters. It's about getting to know this God, what he's like, and how I can have a relationship with him. And if we can help our kids do that, wherever they go in life or they get deployed, they'll be able to have a strong faith. And so plug your kids into a community like in base camp or Ascent or middle school or high school field. Get involved in a small group yourself. yourself. There is a positive impact of a community who's all going in the same direction. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. It's not the totality of what that means, but that's one practical way we can apply it. And then the last one is to have a body that serves him. Not all the statements in the Gospels record this last part. Some of them leave off the part about with all your strength or all your might. But Mark, Mark includes it, and I wanted to talk about this part because it is part of who we are. We're not just a soul. We're not just a heart. We're not just a mind. We are a body. And when it says to love God with all the strength that we have, I think a key part of that is love him physically, tangibly. And that's why Jesus even tied in the second part of and love your neighbor 
as yourself. Love is the tangible expression. If you love God, you will love those that are made in his image. Before Jesus went to the cross, he gathered his disciples in an upper room, washed their feet, and says, hey, you need to do this for other people. Because tonight I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other, not as you love yourself, because some of you don't love yourself a whole lot. Love, love, love one another as I have loved you. In other words, serve other people. Did you know that after the Gospels, that that first commandment is never stated again? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second one, to love your neighbor as yourself, is repeated several times. In fact, we came across it this week as we read in the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians, if you're following along with the church reading plan, Galatians chapter 5 says, Through love, serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's as if they're saying, you know what, guys? If we can get this love people down, God's going to be pretty happy with that. God's going to be really happy when we get great at loving people. But love isn't a feeling. Love isn't something that, that is a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is action. Love is doing something tangibly for another person, a person in need. We are not only to be good, we are to do good. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works, good things, good things. We should help our families make a habit of doing good things, doing good for one another, helping each other around the house, helping mom and dad, helping our kids, working together as a team. We, we need to elevate the value that it is fun to do good for others. You know, I heard a story that, uh, this week. It's a really beautiful story of a girl who just graduated yesterday from Fountain Fort Carson High School. And uh, this girl, for her prom, decided that she wanted to bring a special guest. And so uh, she brought Tanner. Now, most of you don't know, but um, Tanner's fortunate to still be alive. There's many times he's almost died. And as a freshman this year, the, a lot of the kids in the school just rallied around him. And for one of the prettiest girls in school to say, I want you to be my date for prom, you know, it, he knows what that means. <laughs> His dad told me this morning he has a special smile he gives to the girls now. So, but I am so impressed. This girl gets it. You think she's going to be an incredible adult as she's learned this art of loving someone? When other people are thinking of themselves and how they, how they look and who their date is, she's saying, you know what? I want this guy to have the time of his life. So she took him. You know, there was a, a mom I was reading about the other day. She said whenever her dad used to send them off to school, they used to live in a farmhouse, he'd pat, pat her on the back on her purple backpack, and he'd say, honey, go mad. That was his code word for go make a difference. Mad, make a difference. Go mad. We need to send kids out who, who are mad. We're making a difference. And, uh, and we, as, uh, again, as adults, need to lead the way. There are so many things I look back and say, man, I blew that as a parent. You know, honestly, I was, I was not a great, great dad. I look back, there's so many things I wish I could, could have done differently. Because I was so busy trying to, you know, get my life in order and adjust to marriage and have my time. And, you know, I just didn't know. But here's the good thing. When you get to be a grandparent, you get, you get to do it over. <laughs> And I am more committed to my grandkids, to really being intentional with them. I, I, there's nothing I want more for my grandkids, to know Jesus and walk with him, to, to have what I have and to take it further than I even took it. So the other day, I'm with my grandson. We have him on Fridays. Uh, he went with me as I got my hair cut, and afterwards he said, Baba, can we go to McDonald's to get a Happy Meal? I said, will that make you happy? He goes, yes, it will. <laughs> I said, Okay. And of course, it's all about the toy. It's not about the food, it's about the toy. So we go in there, and, and, I, and we had a great time just eating meal, and I had to force him to eat his cheeseburger. And, and then as we're leaving, we're walking out of the restaurant. We get outside, and I notice this elderly couple. I have to be in their 80s, and they're walking across the parking lot really slow. I mean, it's like... And so I decide I'm just going to wait here and hold this door for them. Yes, sir. And it, it takes about three or four minutes for them to get to the door... <laughs> And I don't think they're coming for a Happy Meal. You know, I'm just thinking there's something else, but it's not the Happy Meal that's getting them to McDonald's, but that's their choice of restaurant for the day. And while they're walking over, I look over to Aiden, and I say, Aiden, go, go grab that inside door and hold it, hold it open for them. So he goes inside, and he, he's got to pull like this. <laughs> then he stands like this. 
and he's got the door like this. And finally, after a few minutes, this elderly couple comes through, and the guy comes through first and says, thank you, walks past me, and he goes by Aiden, taps him on the head, says, thank you, young man. And then this woman comes to me, and she says, thank you. And then she goes over to Aiden, and she stops, and she reaches out to take his hand. But he's a little scared because he doesn't know her. He doesn't reach back, but she wants to touch him and take his hand. He say, thank you. And then they walk in, and he lets the door go, and I look at him and says, Aiden, wasn't that fun? He goes, yeah. So fist bumped. I mean, serving is fun. And whether it's ushering together as a family or going to, you know, down to the homeless shelter or whatever it is, we need to lead the way. We need to set the example for our kids. It is, it is fun to serve God. It is fun to love other people. It feels good to give of ourselves to others. See, we need to, we need to set the example and set the pace for our whole families. And they need to see us. They need to see us with hearts that are tender toward God, interacting, sharing with them what God is saying to us. They need, they need to see us worshiping him, praying him, opening our souls to him. They need to see us make our decisions guided by the truth of God's word, how we're being reshaped by what, what the Bible says and what God has to say about everything within our lives. And then we need to roll up our sleeves and say, you know what, we're gonna do something good for somebody today. And if we would lead the way, I can promise you this, your family will have an awesome faith. And so this morning, what I want to do is um, I'm going to ask you to stand. I'm going to ask you to commit yourself, whether you're a parent or a grandparent, or maybe you're one of the kids here today. Maybe you're looking down the road at your family, or maybe you're, you're just looking at your, your position within your family. Would you do those things we talked about today? Because there's nothing greater in life than this. Jesus said it's the most important to love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, everything you have. Not partially, not 80%. I mean, can you imagine telling, telling your wife or your husband, I love you 80%. <laughs> I'm committed to you 75, 76%. Or your little kid, you know, uh, mommy and daddy love you. We love you like 80, 85%. No, we always say I love you with all my heart. That's what God wants. He's a jealous God. He wants all of you. So would you commit today that as far as you are concerned, you'll do everything you can to help your family have a life-giving, dynamic relationship with the Lord. Make that your prayer as we sing this next song. And I'm going to invite our prayer partners right now to be available up front. Maybe today you need to actually do something with your body to show that I'm committed to this. Maybe you need to come up here and pray. Maybe you need to pour out your heart to God about something today because God's been stirring something within your heart. Maybe you need to know it's a safe place to expose the contents of your soul to him. Let's do that as we sing. Our prayer partners are here wherever you are. If you, if you need prayer, just make yourself up here as we sing. And we'll meet you and we'll pray with you. And for the rest of us who remain where we are, let us commit to building our lives upon Jesus Christ.